<laughs> I would have to say I would I would look for somebody who's not afraid to speak what they really think, uh, what's really on their mind. I I think uh, you know the old saying if if uh, if everybody agrees then then everyone else but one is totally unnecessary. So I, I for example, Jeanette here has always been a. a a great partner for me as far as the marketing end of things and I respect her opinion and she's not afraid to speak her mind and uh, I've found more often than not when I listen to her it's uh, it's the right advice so I, I think I look for honesty in somebody who's not afraid to say what they want to you know I don't want to yes people but I do want people to challenge me okay. well I, I Ziggy's been out like th I I think since 1970, as you say, I've uh, my dad started Ziggy, oh, uh, really? Tom Wilson Sr. I've done him 27 years now, so a lo longer than he has actually. But as far as that marketing yourself goes, um, it's funny that you know the character came on so strong that he sort of set the pace. I mean, there is a there is a process that take takes place. Um, when you do licensing or syndication that again is handled by very uh, uh, knowledgeable managers uh, in their field so you you rely upon them because their interests are your interest as well so as far as Ziggy goes he he was uh, his own sort of marketing rep in a way you know based on what his what the interest was for him as far as marketing me or as far as marketing dad that we're, we were kind of along for the ride because people know Ziggy but they don't necessarily know us we're we're behind the scenes we're the guy in the guy behind the curtain basically and uh, I, I think anything that commun communicates well to people and speaks directly to them is going to be uh, that's the best way to market yourself anyway so people will respond to that and they'll come to you so so like the Ziggy pretty much made a personal connection through, I mean, through the character himself. So that's, that he, like you said, he did the marketing for you in that sense? That's what Ziggy's all about. Ziggy is a communicator and a messenger. That's how he was, that's how he was developed. Uh, he's a spokesperson for people's most intimate and um, personal feelings um, because he did come from the greeting card business, uh, you know, which is communication in itself. They call greeting cards uh, me to you which means whatever character is communicating something has to be able to say, I love you, uh, I miss you, get well, uh, you know, all of these things. But they also have to say it for whoever's giving it. And he's, the character has to be generic and direct enough, too, so I can see who's sending that card through Ziggy or I can, I can see who I want to receive that card through Ziggy, in Ziggy himself. So. Okay. He's designed as a marketing monster and, and a communication machine, but he's also very soft and gentle and approachable, which is nice. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I just I want to clarify, but a little bit of Tom runs Ziggy and Friends, and uh, Tom and I together uh, with some other great people have a company called uh, Character Matters. And Character Matters is all about designing and developing characters for branding. So it's a, a, a separate company from Ziggy, and it's exciting to, to be going out into companies and nonprofits and things like that and helping them you know, do what Ziggy's done for so many years, communicate the message of the characteristics of that company or the people that run it. So, um, so then to answer your question, specifically what is licensing, it really comes down to um, you know, leasing the rights to a copyrighted or trademarked entity. I mean, that could be music or art or cartoons, photography, it could be software. But the actual licensing itself, the act of licensing, uh, is uh, you know, utilizing those rights and paying a fee for that service, for a limited type of service. It could be putting it on products or uh, using it in advertising. There's so many different ways you can, you can license. I think learning about the licensing industry is a really great place to start. There's a, a magazine called Global License uh, Magazine, and I think their website is licensemag.com. 
And I think going on that um, is a really great way of reading. It's our industry trade magazine, I think our best industry trade magazine. And you know, you can read about all the different kinds of people in the licensing industry because we cross over between all the creative people into all kinds of manufacturing. And so that's a great, a great place to start and learn about the industry. Well, that's a no. That's, that's a, a great terrific question. question. And you know, the the thing is, sometimes things don't need to be controlled, especially in terms of a, a artistic bent or somebody who's got something a need to create. There's an inner passion that drives them, and uh, sometimes by by pushing something that's already got its own momentum, we can interfere with it. So I I would say simply. In the case you described, I would encourage as much as possible any, any, anything creative or open thinking. Let the person who is exhibiting that find out how deep their passion is for it. Encourage it to move along. If it's strong, it will continue on its own momentum. Uh, once we try and get behind the wheel of somebody else's car, they're no longer driving and they lose passion for it. So I would say kind of a hands-off, but a, a, a loving and uh, encouraging guidance is necessary like that. You know, uh, when you have a creative talent and product, one of the things that you want to start with is having enough work in your style that it really, you really confidently know that that style is, you know, yours, and and then, which one of the first things you want to do is is make sure you really understand um, who your target audience is, and a lot of people come to us and and ask, for, you know, us to evaluate their art or their, yeah. you know, cartoons or things like that, and and. When we ask that question, so who's your target audience? They say everybody loves this, <laughs> and that's the they all you know everybody. The, who does this appeal to? Everybody, <laughs> and that may well be true down the line, but one of the ways um, our I think our marketplace works today is it's very segmented, you know, and and actually that's good for emerging artists and creative people because you can get a foothold in maybe a smaller niche that then could grow into, you know, maybe someday it will be everybody, but you have to start someplace and you don't start with everybody. So I think knowing that you've got enough work, creative work, and knowing who your audience is are important aspects. And then for starting in licensing, you need to think about what, what does your art creative belong on. You know, in other words, it could be on advertising, it could be on products, it could be on apparel, it could be on, you know, any no. anything, right? No, that's so, a great so point. you need to make sure. I mean, when I was licensing Dilbert, you know, he needed to go on office products before he went on apparel. He wasn't exactly a fashion statement, uh -huh. you know, so you need to think logically about your creative. Yeah, in licensing, you have to remember that it's, you know, while, while whatever character or property is being licensed, there's a unique character to that. The same is said for whatever category in, in product it is, too. Some things lend themselves to certain characters in a better way than others. Some will not, uh, and some will actually work against the character. So you want to find that synergy. Um, your market, it's funny, if something is truly expressing its character, the market will respond and you'll have a very good sense of who best you're, who best you're appealing to very quickly, I think, if you're honest about who you are and what you're portraying. Well, I think once you kind of familiarize yourself with the industry a little bit, just general knowledge, of course you can approach an agent. I think the uh, finding out what agents do and don't do and reading up on people who are, you know, reputable and doing deals in kind of your area. I mean, if you've got art, there are people who specialize in art licensing agenting. There are people who specialize in entertainment property agenting. There are people who specialize in children's book agenting and children's book illustrations. So again, knowing what your art is and, and finding the people that are specialized in your, your creative area is important. Um, of course you can approach an agent. Approach an agent as professionally as you would approach a, a 
a studio or a, or a publisher or some other kind of manufacturer that you really want to sell. You need to sell that agent on you just as much as you need to sell um, somebody else. And I think it's good to find an agent. Um, first off, they are invaluable. Mm -hmm. There is a lot to be said for the connections that they make in the industry. Um, these are relationships and yeah. it makes, it's, it's some cases it's taken a professional lifetime to accumulate those. But I think you also want to have a good relationship with them. I mean, it's like dating in a way. You want to find somebody totally. who gets you and you get as well. Okay. And that synergy goes a long way to a very profitable future together. And I'd say ask questions. Mm -hmm. Ask questions, ask questions. Because <laughs> there's agents who do five things, there's agents who do 10 things. You know, and you want to go into that relationship having discussed, really discussed, the details of, you know, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? What are you not going to do? And really, you really want to hammer that out and, with, and make sure that that's represented in your agreement between each other or take a trial period and see if the, you know, the dating works, as Tom says, because it truly is. If this is a business partnership that's going to last a long time, um, not only do you want to, you know, have a kind of a soul connection, but you, you know, you need to trust their business instincts and, and um, those kind of things. It's very difficult to self-license and self-syndicate and represent yourself if you're a creator. Um, you, granted, the uh, I guess the upside is you don't have a, a, a percentage to pay to an agent, but the downside is you don't have all the things they have to offer. For the creator trying to do these things on their own, you're taking away from valuable creative time that really you need for to devote towards your property or your character. I mean, there are two different mindsets at work uh, between the creative process, not that there's not a creative process involved in marketing, but it's of a different genre. And you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, I've found from people I know who've done this, um, time becomes their, their, greatest, uh, their, their greatest commodity, uh, time to do all those things. There's a lot of legwork. So. And I'll agree but disagree because, okay. because I have found that artists today, uh, while doing any deal may be something that artists don't want to do, some of them are, have come from sales backgrounds. or I mean, you never True. know where they're going to have, I mean, they might be very young or they might be in midlife <laughs> turning, you know, changing careers or, or they may be very outgoing. And, if it's possible for people to learn enough about the industry and do one or two deals, I feel that that does make them more marketable to a good agent. So I'm not necessarily saying this is something they, they either want to do ever, but if they try it and can get a couple deals, they can, ha you know, it can turn the tide for them. Um, and should they take the first deal that's offered to them, um, they probably won't have a lot of negotiating power but I think that they need to feel um, a good connection to the company they're doing their deal with, that there's an honesty there. Um, if your gut says don't do the deal, don't do the deal. But if they're offered a, a reasonable amount and they are fairly confident that that's what other artists are being offered and they want to do it, I think they should just um, make sure that someone, um, a, a lawyer, reviews the contract to make sure they're not giving away any no. rights that they shouldn't be. And if you do a one-year agreement for a very specific deal, and it's your first deal, and it gets your toe wet, that leads you to the next deal, that is how you start. No, I, I think that's a great point, although I would also agree but disagree <laughs> to the extent that yeah, sure. you should be involved uh, if you're going to do that. And again, mm -hmm. it depends on the kind of person you are. A lot of creators are very solitary and not very mm -hmm. social, Do not are not great at putting themselves out there. Some are, some maybe later in life are, are very good and have those social mm -hmm. skills and those connections. If you do this on your own, it's very important to have uh, as much knowledge at your disposable for when that first and or if even only uh, offer comes in, you know exactly what it is you're agreeing to because it's a, it's a tricky road. There's a lot of variables in each element of every offer that uh, you really need to know your way around a bit. People checking with somebody who consults is often a very good idea just to get 
you know, just to get some foreknowledge before you go in and try something like this on your own. Yeah. Get some coaching or consulting and, and, and make sure that you understand that the lawyer that's going to review your contract is not going to give you business advice. Mm -hmm. The two different roles. So you need to talk to somebody who can give you business advice about that deal. Not, uh, but not, just, all, not yeah. just legal advice. Not all agents are going to have the same passion and care about your character mm -hmm. necessarily as, as they would about, uh, say, something else. Some, some just see it as another job. You want to make sure not only do they, does your agent, if you do it, if you have an agent, not only do they get you, but do they get what you're selling, what your mm -hmm. character is, and believe in it, because belief is by far the, probably the best motivator for somebody yeah. to, to trust you and to take a chance with you as far as licensing. By the same token, if you do this yourself, it's your passion and your belief that's going to be your best asset when you're selling your product when they hear you talk about it, when they see your eyes light up, when the passion and, you know, and all of that fire comes out, when you're talking about something you're excited, that's a contagious thing. And that goes a long way to selling, Absolutely. and it's honest. Absolutely. So. Well, I think that that's a great question for the agent and the creator to be discussing very early on. It's uncommon these days, I think you'd agree, that licensing would start in a local area. Licensing by its nature is national, at least, mm -hmm. because the deals that are done are um, for a manufacturer who probably already has existing channels of distribution across the U.S., if not internationally. Uh, most contracts I see come to people, say, worldwide uh, immediately. And it's up to you to cross that out and say, okay, now what territories do you really want? I'm not giving you worldwide rights unless you can sell worldwide. So you're probably talking about starting in the U.S. and then you do need to make a decision as to when you would, you would, you know, look into international. But I've seen people whose art just really hit it in Japan, or or it went, it had a few niches internationally. Well, right. And culturally, quickly. some some cultures or regions of Characters the world respond really differently well. to things. Uh, Ziggy's very strong in Latin American countries for, for some reason. Mm -hmm. They respond well. Um, more so than, say, some other countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, regionally, there's an appeal to a certain product or, or character. But okay. uh, Jeanette's right. It is, you know, if you're doing something with a product, you assume that the company that will be producing that product has a, a national reach to begin with. I think mm -hmm. also it's important to mention, too, the, the contract process overseas is a very complicated yes, thing and can be very expensive and it's something you want to work up to generally. Yes, yeah, so a lot of agents are, you know, are US agents and then they have a connection to international agents. You know, few US agents do the world. That just doesn't work that way. You know, cuz there's there's a lot of details on understanding the legalities and the the cultural, you know, nuances in different countries and things like that. So um, so it depends on, you know, what you you agree with your agent. They but, might ask for worldwide initially or... And they uh, might, might subcontract to other agents. The agents might want worldwide and they might subcontract to other agents and have an existing network that they feel is reliable and they'll tell you about. But, um, but if you're a local person, you, you probably... Licensing is probably not something you'll do in a real small scale, um, you know, but um, because people are probably not... Well, it, you can. You can do licensing for, you know, regional ads and things like that. But if you want project product nationally, just find a manufacturer who, who has distribution around the nation. If it's very grassroots um, and, you know, this is your hometown, you, you probably the first thing you'll do is, is do something very locally. But there's, there's a benefit of things like the licensing show and, and opportunities to actually set up a booth and put your wares out where people from all over come and can see you, see what it is you have and um, they come to you and they specifically come to look for new things. Um, that's, a, that's a process that seems to be growing and has always been very popular. Um, and, you, and then it's a potluck, it's a potpourri of people who ever happen to come by and you do get a good sense of how you, your product appeals or, or how your character will appeal to different groups or products and things like that just by who shows interest in it. If they do subcontract out to somebody who's who specializes in those markets, they they know the people, they know the language, they've done this before, they can make you translate a lot better. 
I've had a situation where uh, in Japan, uh, and again, this is a very cultural difference, uh, mm -hmm. did a company, uh, there was a company uh, called Sanrio that did some, some Ziggy product. We saw some towel prototypes that were done. And uh, they came in and Ziggy was, there was a, a towel, Ziggy was this little, character in the corner and Tom Wilson was, the name was written as the motif and the design over there. And we thought obviously this is a mistake, you know, the character should be at least part of the designer up there and it's no, there is a, there is a, uh, an interest in actually the character of the letters and everything else that can be used as a design and that's a popular, but it's a cultural difference. It's one we're not familiar with here. So, um, and we were suitably convinced that this would sell over there. Um, and you have to trust the, your, that's you a place we have to trust your agent that they know the market and the design style and so. But yeah, translation, fortunately we haven't insulted anybody in a, in a, in a translation. I remember Dilbert some. comic strips, they didn't have a word in France for cubicle, you know, and so the syndication had to go through that before we could then do product and it's, you know, yeah, there's that's always, the yeah, there's, there's always something. Yeah, I do. I mean, there's certainly a lot of shakeups, you know, happening, but I, I really believe that, and as you were saying, there's so much excitement now about creative thought, and there, it's so important to not just the people who are thinking it, but to businesses and to society and to everything, and I just have to believe that, you know, we have a lot of people thinking about, you know, how technology is changing and how uh, you know, how to protect things and, and um, you can't go out into the marketplace and be fearful. I mean, that's, you have to make some leaps of faith and, and um, you know, but I'm yeah, optimistic no, person. I, I think I, I'm optimistic too because not, not so much that human nature has changed over the years or, or business, but I think in one respect you can say, you know, this, there is a new respect for creative thinking and in fact, uh, creativity itself ideas have, because of there's been such a homogenization and a follow the leader and a redo and a redo of much the same thing, um, ideas are now commodities. I think that's something brand new. Uh, you could almost say it's the age of creativity. It's a, mm -hmm. uh, because it's a rarity, it's a scarcity now and people are recognizing that in the market. So people with ideas, people with something new and innovative um, are gaining respect where they didn't have it at all. They were more like grist for the mill to crank into the machine. So, uh, and people in the industry, because it's their bread and butter, understand this now. So they, they pass that respect on. So it's a good time. It's a, it's a good time for creative people and it's a good time for new ideas. It's a, a brand new time.